Hello to all of you loyal podcast listeners. Thanks for tuning in to the Grow Wire podcast. I am your host, Fritz Nelson, and I am joined by the one and only Kendall Fisher, producer and host of the Grow Wire show. You're also missing one part that I would probably put on my resume, which is pizza connoisseur. I'm a mm. hardcore pizza connoisseur, which will lead into what you're about to talk about. See, you have played a role in this podcast by helping create a segue. There we go. As we call it in the biz. Uh-huh, a segue. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Because on this episode, we're going to talk pizza. Yes. Pizza, pizza, yeah. We headed over to New York City, where we met up with a man who I'm going to deem the pizza god, Tony Mangieri who is the founder of Manhattan's Una Pizza Napolitana. Una Pizza Napolitana? I just know it as Una Pizza. And this, is the, what a what a place. Okay, so we get into Tony's childhood. The influences, what led him to becoming a chef. We talk about his love of food and passion for pizza making and how that's guided him throughout his nearly three-decade career across three major cities and to the point he's reached today, overseeing what's been dubbed one of New York City's best sit-down pizza joints, if you believe the New York Times. Yes, I do. Okay. Well, they said it, not me. So I I love this episode because you can hear the true love for pizza and food in Tony's voice. A love for cooking, a love for pizza, a love for people, and for doing what's right and what's good. You will not want to miss it. I'm sorry you can't taste it. Mm, Me too. Yeah. Coming up next. You're listening to the Grow Wire podcast, a place where you will learn the ins and outs of growing a business, running a business, or even taking your big idea, career, or personal development to the next level. It's all possible. Our host, Fritz Nelson, the editor-in-chief of growwire.com, will take you on an exploration of growth through candid conversations with some of the most brilliant minds in entrepreneurship, entertainment, business development, and more. Whatever your goal, we know you'll walk away with the right tools to help fuel your journey of growth. Before we get into this episode with Tony Mangieri, and since we're talking about some of the best places for pizza in the world, we want to thank our sponsors over at the Second City. Here's a little business insight that's almost too good to be true. Learning works best when you're laughing. Second City Works, the B2B side of comedy mecca, The Second City, unleashes the improv methods pioneered on their world-famous stages to help companies and individuals improve performance. Their professional development programs unlock better ways to communicate, collaborate, and innovate, all while laughing till you learn. Visit secondcityworks.com to find out more. We also want to be sure you head over to our website, growwire.com, to hear more stories from businesses and entrepreneurs in the food and beverage industry. For example, we chatted with Sushi Rito founders. That's a real thing, Sushi Rito. It's a real thing. Mm, Sounds good. I'm really hungry right now all of a sudden. Talking about pizza, Sushi Ritos. I wonder who put this all together to include food and, you know, similar content. Somebody Mm. had to have... Somebody that had through. to produce this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Some producer. Yeah. Well, thank goodness. And um, that person, <laughs> whose name I will not say, um, said that Sushi Rito founders Peter Yen and Ty Mahler founded this winning niche. We've also provided insights on key metrics every food and beverage company should track, as well as top trends from the industry in 2019 that business businesses can learn from as they continue to make plans for 2020. Make sure to catch all of that now on growwire.com. All right, we want to talk about, let's talk about you first. Who is Anthony Mangieri? Uh, Anthony Mangieri is a lost soul (laughs) (laughs) wandering the earth, trying not to get arrested. No. Um, Have you been arrested? No. Oh, okay. No, I have no record because you can't have one to get a liquor license. Oh, good point. Any restaurant tour that tries to act like they're hardcore, if they're serving beer and wine, they've never been arrested. So just 
So if they act tough, just remember they actually haven't been arrested or you can't serve beer and wine. Um, so we've, we've, we've said you're not a right. known criminal. I'm not an ex-convict. Right. Okay, good. Um, Let's start. Gosh, I don't know who I am. I'm someone that is a father and a baker and trying to stay on a path of spirituality and peace within myself, I think, and pay my bills. <laughs> and pay my bills. That's pretty much Anthony. <laughs> what led you to be a pizza god? That's my word. I think uh, any success that we've had at the pizzeria or myself personally is probably just connected to longevity first, you know. Um, I've been doing this since I'm 15 and I'm 48, and it's all I've done. So I think that's probably one key thing. Um, most people switch around a lot or change professions or in the food world change concepts or follow trends, and I've kind of just started out doing this thing and pretty much have just kind of stuck with the same concept that I started with at a very young age. but within that concept, uh, evolving to make it better, but not really changing it. And I think that has given me some, you know, notoriety or clout in the pizza world. And um, gosh, I don't know what else. What, I mean, what, it, what do you think it came from? I mean, are the people in the family that were bakers or? or? Yeah, um, well, my grandfather was a ice cream maker and a candy maker, um, and he was, I love him already. Yeah, no, and he was really successful. I mean, from family stories, you know, he died right before I was born. Um, I'm named after him. His name was Anthony. Um, and I, you know, heard stories of his passion and his fanaticism for what he did. And, you know, at the same time, he worked himself, you know, into a wheelchair and spent his later years, like, you know, with a hearing aid and not being, really being able to do much. But... Um, you know, I did grow up with his stories and the myth of him. Um, I, other than that, in food, that was the only thing in my family food-wise. I, I often get asked by people, like, how did you get into, like, this or that? Or why do you like certain things? And I, I don't know. I mean, I think probably the only thing I could say is having maybe a mother who was very supportive and non-judgmental was probably key. Um, and I hope to be the same way with my daughter. Um, you know, and leaving a child to have the exposures that they find on their own with no real expectations. You know, as silly as it sounds, my mother really used to be so openly supportive of me that, like, she would drive me to CBGB's every Sunday for the Sunday matinee shows because I used to come up here and hang out. And it was a day, New York City was not what it is now. I mean, you know. Um, we're talking like, you know, in the 80s. And because she cared about me and wanted to be supportive of me, she would drive me and my friends up to CBGB's and like wait outside of CBGB's on the Bowery in the car with my little sister just so I wouldn't end up getting myself into trouble. Um, that kind of stuff, like that stuff really sticks with you as a kid. And I had friends who, you know, I grew up with that then ended up getting into drugs and all kinds of crazy stuff. And I... I just never did, and I think part of that was connected to like almost a loyalty and a and a feeling of not wanting to disappoint my mother, but not based on like her expectations, but based on her love for me. That then I wanted to reciprocate that. So when I would come to the line of maybe making a bad decision or friends using angel dust or God knows what else back then, I would just be like, nah, you know, like there's somebody out there that loves me and I, and I want to give that back to them and hopefully make right, the right choice when choices are coming up. And having that kind of foundation with her, I think, allowed me to kind of go through life and feel like I could almost do anything, you know? So just kind of weaving through things and finding my voice and sticking with what I believed when it came to pizza then eventually and kind of just butting heads maybe with the mainstream of food at the time. Now it's very, you know, popular to style a pizza. But, you know, when we opened in 96, 
I think we might have been the first Neapolitan pizzeria in the United States, and especially hand-mixed dough, naturally leavened, all the things that now are like catchphrases and good marketing terms. I mean, back then they weren't. People would come in and thought that I was from outer space, honestly, especially Italian-American, New Jersey, like, you know, people grew up with a certain style of pizza, and what we were making was so far from that. It was a tough, it was a tough sale in the beginning. You started as a baker. Yes. So making breads or also making sweet things? Um, no, not sweet things, um, other than some sweet breads. Um, but no, bread baker. Yeah, yeah. And how you said you were 15? I started baking when I was 15. I opened the bakery when I was 20 years old. And I opened the pizzeria in 1996, which would have made me... 25 ish or 24. What goes through your head when you're 20 and opening a business and 25 and opening a business? Well, I mean, one thing was I felt jealous that my friends had girlfriends and cars and I didn't have anything because I didn't go get a real job. And, you know, I definitely was questioning my decision making at that point where I was like baking. I, I was so obsessed, though, at that point with, like, Italy and what I thought was the breads or the pizzas. At that point, it was just bread and eventually became pizza. What was um, what I thought bread was 100 years ago? And, you know, all I had was an oven and a table, and that was, in, that was pretty much it. Like, I hand-mixed everything. It was all hand-shaped. I did all the work myself. I would go in it my mom would actually drive me to the bakery because I didn't have a car and drop me off. And I would work in there from 10 o'clock at night until eight o'clock in the morning. Then I would open up and sit at this little counter that we built and sell bread until two in the afternoon. Then she would pick me back up and drive me home and I would pass out. And I did this for like three years or whatever. And nobody got it. Like people would come in, they would be like, oh, the bread is stale because it was hard. But I was like, no, it's not stale. I'm baking it with a thick, crunchy crust. Or it would be like dark on the bottom, like it's burnt. I'm like, no, it's made in a wood-fired oven. It was so foreign to like suburban America at that point, like any of this kind of stuff that I was just on my own like little trip of what I was doing and nobody seemed to really care or get it. And I honestly didn't care if they did. <laughs> That's awesome. Did you, had you been to Italy? I mean, yeah, what, yeah, yeah. I was, I started going to Italy at a pretty young age with my family and you know, and I lived with my grandmother, um, who was Italian. Uh, she lived like kind of diagonal from us. And so like I grew up this like really being attracted to history and knowing things. I mean, even I've always been like that, even with music, like it's all kind of the same thing. It's like if you tell me like, oh, you know, have you ever heard of this band? I'm always like, well, where are they from? What are they about? What do they stand for? So I was the same way. Like, I just like to know like what I'm involved in and so it was the same for like when I started to want to know about Italy and family tradition and the history and the family tree and all these kind of things. I just like almost created like this thing in my head of like what it was all about and like the stories of them and these little towns in Italy and you know one great grandmother that supposedly was like sleepwalking at night and opened his door and fell out and went down a cliff and died and all these weird stories that are almost like mythological, um, you know. And that was the beginning of that. So you open this bakery, you're 20 years old, you're getting, you know, four or five hours of sleep a day, but you managed to get your hands on an oven and a place. Yeah. I mean, how'd that happen? That was all my family and my grandmother, you know, my mom and dad, my dad and mom um, certainly didn't have money or came from, you know, they were very blue collar. My dad worked um, originally at a, uh, a Navy base as an electrician and then later on worked in Atlantic City as an electrician. My mom was a, a like a, not a secretary, but like a higher up in that kind of field in one of the county uh, buildings where we grew up. And that was it. My grandmother was retired, but you know, thrifty. Um, and yeah, they just kind of helped me. I mean, we, my dad and I built that space ourselves. I mean, this was also way before like now, which is like trying to open a business I mean, you need like 
a guarantee on the lease. You've got to, like, guarantee the lease term for, like, you know, half the time. So it's like, imagine, like, you sign a lease in New York City. It's like, you got to, like, have, like, 500 k in the bank just to sign a lease. So they check your bank and you can guarantee that you could cover it. And, all and then the first couple of months, the rent's 10000 a month or 20000 a month. I mean, it's a different world. I mean, back then, you know, when I opened in the suburbs, you know, I, th I can't remember what the rent was, but I would imagine it was probably, like, $500 a month. And there was no guarantee or any like that. And it was, you know, maybe the first two months rent. Um, my dad and I did all the build out in the place. Um, you know, I'm, I did the build out in all my other restaurants basically too, except for this one. Um, so I'm pretty capable when it comes to construction, growing up with my dad doing electrical jobs and stuff. Um, yeah, so it was super bare bones. It literally was an oven that we had ordered the pieces and put together ourselves, because it was pre-being able to get these kind of ovens from Europe. So we ordered the pieces and put it together. Um, and we had, uh, prior to this, built an oven in the backyard that we had no idea, but <laughs> I wanted one so bad. And I was trying to make pizza and stuff on the, on the floor of the fireplace in the living room, because <laughs> I just knew as a kid, when I was becoming obsessed with this, that fire was the key. And I had been to Italy, and I'm like, that must be the key. So I was trying to do that, but that wasn't working. But it gave a little bit of a hint to it. So, you know, we built one in the backyard. That worked sort of okay. So when we opened the bakery, you know, we got these this, like, kit, and we put it together. I mean, the place was super bare bones. We built a little wall to separate the whole space from the front. And then in the front, we built a little counter and, like, you know, did just everything ourselves from like the hardware store. And had, I had no employees. It was cash only. <laughs> did, do you, was, sorry to be so blunt, but was it a success or failure? I mean, everything I've done financially has been a failure. <laughs> 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 um, no, that's not totally true, but I definitely would say that that was that was a struggle. I mean, really, it was way before its time. So, you know, I, and again, like, you know, I, I never really made choices back then and through most of my life based on what would be financially viable. It's always been like, what's the truth? What do I want to do? I mean, now I have a family and the cliches all start to fall into place and you feel responsible and you'd wake up with like a panic attack. You're like, oh my God, I got a kid. I got to, you know, survive. We have to be serious now. Um, but yeah, that going back to that, yeah, it was okay. It was definitely not like anything great. I made a little bit of money. I mean, I lived at home, you know, um, and sort of from that place, you know, when the lease was up, I felt like I was done with it and that I shouldn't continue. And I felt like I did kind of what I wanted to do and prove to myself that I could do this, but I felt like you know, it probably wasn't worth doing this. And I was starting to really feel the pressures of like, what am I gonna do with my life? I was still so young. My friends were all in college and, you know, starting to move forward. And I was like, what am I gonna do? Like live at home the rest of my life and like barely survive. So at that point when the lease was up, I was gonna kind of um, just get a job maybe in Atlantic City where my dad worked, you know, in the union and be, a regular guy and in my heart I had this feeling of like I really should try the pizza if I don't do it I'm, I'm gonna spend the rest of my life feeling like I should have done this and once we closed that place I'd saved a tiny bit of money and you know I was thinking what should I do and we ended up finding this little spot um, that was for lease closer to where I was born than where the bakery was. And I ended up, you know, talking to the landlord and I got a deal and I, and I took it. And then me and my dad rebuilt that spot. And that spot was even easier to build because it was an old ice cream place. So it was all tiled. And so basically in that place, like we built like a counter, we put the oven in and that was it. It was super bare bones. Everything was hand washed. There was no dish machine. Dough was all hand mixed. I made like two kinds, I opened making two, two types of pizza, one with tomato sauce, one with tomato sauce and cheese. They were like $5 each and some soda, and that was it. And I opened up. And within this story, there's a little sub story of when I had the bakery, 
this woman who was, at the time I didn't know this because I wasn't really following anything, she was kind of a big deal in food and she was on the James Beard Foundation and she was a syndicated food writer for the United States and was the main food person for New Jersey. And she came into the bakery and ended up writing a story and titled it The Best Bread. And she wrote this huge story. And so within that time of while I was doing bread, she wrote this story and it came out and I came in one day, I did my bread. That morning I was putting the bread out on the shelves and I'm getting ready and I look out and there's like 50 people waiting outside <laughs> the bakery. And I was like, holy moly, what is going on? And I opened the door and there's like all these people I sold out in like 10 minutes because I wasn't making that much bread because I had no customers. <laughs> And everybody's coming in, they're like, oh my God, you were in an article, did you see? She said it's the best bread in America and all this other stuff. I'm like, oh my God. So that <laughs> gave me some fuel for a while. Plus sleep that night, a little extra sleep if you saw that's that. True. Yeah. That's true, that's true. I was like calling my mom, you gotta come and pick me up, I'm done already, this is amazing. Um, so when I, fast forward now back to the pizzeria thing, when I opened the pizzeria, um, she ended up coming and finding me and then wrote another story about it being the best pizza. Um, in you know around which american company started with a guy in a garage was featured on shark tank and now has over 1 million customers hint they're reducing crime in neighborhoods everywhere here's ring video doorbell founder jamie Simonoff with his secret to success it's true in just a few years we've had huge growth we've hired hundreds of people expanded our warehouse and we're shipping millions of units a year all while making sure our customers are happy i've had lots of things to worry about but i never worry about our finance and accounting because we use NetSuite from Oracle. From the beginning, NetSuite let me see what's going on with my business in real time, from revenues to expenses, customers and orders, even HR. I run my business from a dashboard right on my phone. NetSuite has been my business management system from 10 to a team of over 1,000, and NetSuite will be my choice as we continue to innovate and grow. Go to netsuite.com slash ring to see how Jamie scaled his business. You'll also get our free guide titled Overcoming Your Five Obstacles to Growth. That's netsuite.com slash ring for your free guide and the story of a great American company. netsuite.com slash ring. Well, let's talk about the pizza. And from what I understand, you have a very particular attention to detail, particularly around the dough. What's so special about the dough? Um, yeah, definitely uh, the dough is the focus. Um, what's so special about the dough? Well, I mean, in the original pizzeria, um, the dough was mixed by hand. So that was already something unique. Um, and that's how I made pizza from 96 until 2008, nine. So even in the East Village, when I opened there, it was all hand mixed for most of that run um so that was the initial thing like you know but bigger than the hand mixing and obviously now I don't hand mix and I've over the years you know it's been 12 years or whatever since since then um that I've been using a mixing machine the real thing in the dough is that it's naturally leavened which now is becoming very popular um but to me, like the art, the beauty, the mystery in dough was this idea of like being able to just take like flour and water and put it together and it would become a life. And it's like this amazing creation that's very difficult to control, but with years and years, you learn a little more about it and you kind of figure out how to work with it. But when it works, it makes the most interesting product, the most digestible product, um, I mean, it just, it gives every, you know, it gives you a singular voice in your product because each space, each location is going to make it taste a little bit differently. You know, the, the dough that I make in New Jersey back then in 96 is not the same flavor profile as dough that I made in the East Village to San Francisco to back to New York City. I mean, because you, when you're dealing with just literally flour and water, and then eventually some sea salt being added in, um, you know, you're really like pulling from like what's in the wheat, what's in the air in the space, what's in the water, and what's in your hands, what's in just the, the vessel that it sits in, because to make it become a dough, the fermentation takes place by pulling natural yeast that's floating in the air. 
it's the bacteria that's in the air. And the, when you use a good quality wheat, there's natural sugars that occur in that, and they attract that when you add the water, and it becomes this thing. So that was always and has been my focus and passion. And when I'm in a great mood or in a stressed mood or when the product is beautiful and we're all excited or when it's not, it is 99% of the time the dough. I mean, anyone can put a bunch of stuff on top of pizza and make it interesting. The more stuff you put on it, you know, I mean, you're just, it's gonna taste good. I mean, che melted cheese with spice on it is tasty. You know, from 7-Eleven to, you know, anywhere else, it's like it's tasty. So, you know, to me, what is the art of this? What is the passion? What keeps it interesting for, you know, whatever amount of years, almost 25, yeah, 25 years or more of baking and 23 plus years of pizza making is always back to the dough. And, I mean, you're passionate about this. I mean, this is there's a magic and a, and a, and an, and an art to this, but the science of it, you know, a wild or naturally occurring yeast, as you said, depends on where it's grown, what's in the air, which also depends on what time of year it is, I imagine. Um, and so if you experimented, I mean, obviously you're still using a natural yeast, but if you tried from different regions and found like, how far does your passion go? Well, uh, well, my passion goes, I think, as far as I can go. Um, I have only made the dough wherever I am, so I haven't gone and made it anywhere else to see how it would work unless I live there. Um, but as far as experimenting within what I'm doing, I mean, that is endless. I mean, we literally change flowers every day. I use different mixes of flowers. I, everyone teases me, you know, here and jokes around because like you never know what you're gonna get because I'm always all over the place or then I find a mix or a blend of different flowers that we're using and I kind of like it and then one night it doesn't work so good and literally the next day I come in and I start all over. <laughs> And it's like, everybody's like, wouldn't it be better to just do little changes? <laughs> and instead I'm just like totally, you know, I'm trying to get a little bit better grip on doing that because, you know, as the business is growing and I'm about to do the other business, you know, the second location, I need to kind of hone things in a little bit to keep them within a, a space that like everybody else can deal with and not, you know, it's different if I'm making the dough and making every pizza and my hands on every single thing, I can create a stress and a torture for myself and no one else has to deal with it. But to be a pizza guy and come in and have bad dough to deal with because I decided to do something wacky is not really fair um, to them. On the customer side of things, I think sometimes they don't get that either. But to me, that is kind of sad because the beauty, I think, of coming into a place like this and what I would have always hoped and what I think some people get is knowing that you can come in and even though it's just pizza and even though we have such a limited menu isn't it amazing that you can come into a restaurant and kind of be like i don't know what road these guys are taking me on tonight but it's going to be cool and sometimes it's more puffy sometimes it's flatter sometimes it's more sour some all obviously within a realm of excellence which i expect we do because that's what we're about here and that's not egotistical but we are committed to you know, using the best ingredients, focusing on all these details that, you know, I would hope and expect that when people come in, they're like almost trusting us. That's sort of what you're buying into. If you come in here, you're buying into a 20 plus year experiment. So you should come in and just kind of ride with that and be like, wow, last week when I had the pizza, it was like this. And this week it's like that. It's within here and it's still within the excellent brackets, but it can kind of go this way, that way, over here, over there. That's sort of the beauty of a natural product, you know. You also are meticulous about, as I understand it, the sea salt, the oregano, the buffalo mozzarella, like, you know. Have, you've experimented with that over the years as yeah, well? Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, you know, I've, I've experimented and continue to experiment nonstop. I mean, it's, I have no, no loyalty to any products, you know, which is unusual in the restaurant business. Probably doesn't get us the best prices on ingredients because there's no consistency of ordering. Um, I mean, I try to find stuff that I like and I kind of stick with it for as long as I can, but I'm definitely not like 
locked into one thing that I'm like, this is the greatest thing I've ever found. I'm never going to change. And I think that's just part of what keeps it interesting also and keeps it where I'm growing mentally and emotionally because I'm not interested in, you know, creating a new concept or, you know, doing stuff where it's almost like you're chasing your tail to almost get customers in the door to be relevant. Instead, my tail chasing is trying to make this one product as good as I possibly can and relentlessly pushing on that. And that's where I'm chasing my tail. Not like, oh, maybe we should do this weird, you know, fermented garlic thing on this or do this weird abstract thing like that or try to be like relevant to whatever trend is popular right now in, in food. Instead, it's like we're just doing this one simple product and the the focus and the chasing and the pursuit is just this one product. How can it be better? How can it be better? How can it be better? I mean, that that it's just I amazing. Sound like a nut. <laughs> no, it, it, it's amazing. And I think, you know, so you get a consistent experience. You know what you're going to get when you come in here. Um, within those brackets. Within those brackets. There's still stuff going on yeah. where you can get something um, a little bit different. And also, I know you do some meats, but you typically no meat. Uh, well, no, that's not true. We okay. do have, yeah, we have, I mean, it's been an evolution again. Like everything that does change at the pizzeria um, has been organic and very slow. That idea of like, you know, oh, we got a bad review. I'm going to change who I am or what we do. That's not what this place is about and never has been. And as long as I'm in it, never will be. Um, but within that statement, I'm also not afraid to have us evolve naturally or what makes sense. Um, you know, we do have, you know, again, I started out with two pizzas, which was like tomato sauce or tomato sauce and cheese. And then I added one in New Jersey because, I mean, imagine how far back this is. You couldn't get cherry tomatoes year round. Doesn't that sound crazy? Like in the food stores, anywhere, there were no cherry tomatoes year round. This is how long ago this was. It seems so crazy. It's like you couldn't even buy broccoli rob back then. Like, like it was really a different world. So when I was there, for example, just to give a little key to the evolution of things, like I would go to the, the farm market near where I lived and in the summer they had Jersey tomatoes, which are really amazing tomatoes. Um, one of the prized crops of New Jersey is tomatoes, blueberries, and a few other things. And their Jersey tomatoes are really fantastic. So in the summer, I started buying these things. And then I started being like, oh, I'll make my margarita, but I'll offer one without sauce. I'll put these fresh tomatoes on it. People went nuts for it. Then I was like, well, I could make the same pizza now, but without the tomatoes, and it's just a white pizza. It's a Bianca pizza, which is just the mozzarella, basil, and garlic without it. So then those two tomatoes, I would make in the summer. Then after a little bit of time, you started to find an accessibility to grape tomatoes and cherry tomatoes year round that were flavorful and they were being brought in from California. So then I added it to the menu full time. Then that became four pizzas. Then from that, I kept those four pizzas and I never added anything else until I moved to California. Then when I moved to California, I was like, oh, you know what I should add? a pizza and dedication to my wife as like this big move and we were on the verge of getting married and all this stuff. And so her favorite style of pizza was one with arugula and smoked cheese. So I found a way to get this really amazing smoked buffalo mozzarella and did this pizza and named it after her. Then the next evolution was this guy was always bringing me eggs and he was like, you should make a pizza with eggs. You should make pizza. And I was like, eh, eh, eh. And then we had our daughter and I was like, oh, I should make a pizza. I'll use his eggs. Eggs represent birth. And I came up with this pizza that's very similar to like an Easter flavored profile that you would find in the south of Italy, which also represents birth at that time and renewal and Easter and spring. And then, so I only made that pizza on the day my daughter was born and named it after her. And this has been kind of the evolution. And then since New York, I added one for my daughter, or for uh, my aunt as a commemoration of coming back to the East Coast. And the new place in New Jersey, we're gonna add one as a commemoration of my partner down there to his mother who is elderly and is a wonderful woman. And so we keep this evolution going and I'm in the works to do a few things here that are gonna be, I think, 
here and new location in New Jersey, which I think are going to be what people have always wanted from us and we're about to do. And I think it's a, again, it's an, it's an organic evolution um, that's going to allow us to focus more on pizza. And, you know, the New York location, we started to have some small plates and it's always been something that I didn't want to have in the place because it, it, kind of takes away from the focus of what the place is, which is dough and making pizza. So I'm on the verge of doing some real changes here that are, I think, going to make the place really back on track, but with a step forward and a step more towards, I think, what people wanted from me, um, pizza-wise. So let's, uh, there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah, I know. Uh, I don't know if I want to go too deep in that yet. Well, and that's fine. (laughs) But I actually want to talk about going to San Francisco. Yeah. What made you want to do that? Moving to San Francisco was, um, you know, so when I opened in East Village, I opened with one goal. At that point, I had been in New Jersey now, and I had had the pizzeria, Um, This woman wrote that article about the bread. She came and wrote an article about the New Jersey one. Then there was a very famous food writer who is still a friend of mine now. Um, From then, I met him and we became friends over the years, uh, Ed Levine. And he's the guy that founded Serious Eats. And he was a very, very big guy in food and cookbooks and all that stuff. So he was writing a book on pizza. She was him, uh, Ed Levine, and this woman, uh, Andrea Klerfeld, we're both on the James Beard thing and they were friends and he was working on his big pizza book and she's like, you got to come to New Jersey and meet this guy, Anthony. He makes the best pizza. And he's like, my book is done. I'm not going to New Jersey another time. And she's like, I'm basically from what I've heard, she was like, if you don't come down and try his pizza, I'm never talking to you again. (laughs) And so she strong armed him in. He took the train down and it was pivotal in kind of the initial success of Una when it moved to New York City. At that point, I had already started trying to think about opening in New York. And I was planning like, I gotta do something big. I gotta show the world. So he came down, he, he met me, he added me in the book. Not only did he add me in the book, he actually had a whole chapter about me in the book. Whoa. Then he went on with this book, became successful and you know, within that, he was on national TV and in every newspaper and all the magazines and, you know, all these things. And it was always like, what are your favorite pizzerias in America? And I was always listed as one of them, along with one or two other guys in the country. And so timing wise, that came out right when I was opening in New York. And it just pushed me into a success that I had never expected. Um, Within all that, when I was already planning to come to New York, you know, I had already thought in my head that I would wanted to go to California. I was still young. I knew no one in California. I had no national success. I was still in New Jersey. I was going out to California for mountain biking and stuff when I could. And so instead, I was like, instead of going to California, I'm going to go to New York. I'm going to open up in New York. I am going to blow people's minds. I'm going to make the best pizza in the world. And I am going to do this. I'm going to find success and I'm going to get out. So I always went into New York at that point with this idea of like, I'm doing this with a plan. Like I wasn't coming up to like get stuck into the restaurant world, which is like alcoholism and drugs and all kinds of things that detract you from your path. Um, You know, I came in and I was like, I'm going to open up, I'm going to do this, and I'm getting out of this. And along the way, it was hard to sometimes stay on that path with that because it got very successful. It got bigger than I expected. It got crazy. We had huge lines. I was exposed to things that I didn't expect. I mean, the only good thing that I had was all those years already. So within that, I just tried to keep coming back, stay on the path, and know that like my run in the East Village would come to an end um and you know and that's i that's how i ended up moving to california you know the plan had always been to kind of go out there and live out there and see what it was like and experience that um so and how long were you there in california uh i was in california for a little over eight years yeah and how did about eight and that was in san francisco in the city how did they react to your pizza 
Um, I mean, initially when we opened up, it was insane. It, the, the pizzeria had gone to like wacky status between the time that I closed in Manhattan, New York City, and opened in SF, you know, because also like when I closed in New York, I just closed. I didn't tell anybody I was going to close. So we were like, we had these huge lines. I had like celebrities waiting online to come in. We were selling out every night and like we were open on, you know, our days that were open. So our last day of the week was Sunday. And then I just never reopened. No one knew I was going to do this except my very tight inner circle. And that was it. And people were like, what the hell happened to him? This is pre-internet stuff right. too. We didn't even have really, we did have a website actually, but it was one page that didn't change. It just had like a picture with the address and phone <laughs> number. This is before, I didn't even, have, I mean, there was no iPhones then. You know, I mean, this is like, you know, 2008, 2000, no, 2009. Um, so, or I didn't have an iPhone. I don't know if they're <laughs> out there, but whatever. Um, yeah, so we just closed. So that space and that gap between when I closed New York City and when I opened in San Francisco, it had just gotten out all over the place. People wanted to know what I was going to do. People were trying to find me and reach me. And it wasn't like I was doing it on purpose. I just didn't really care. And I had sold that place for some money and I was living off that money. And honestly, if it would have been enough money, I would have never come back. <laughs> So I did come back and open an SF. So when I opened an SF, it was crazy. People were waiting online in front of that place, sometimes in the afternoon. Like I would get done making dough in the morning and I would leave to go home for lunch and it would be people at the door already waiting. And I'd just be like, this is so whacked. It didn't last like all those kind of things don't. It started to slowly, you know, taper down and adjust into like what a normal business should be. But the first couple of months was craziness. They um, were they were used to uh, sprout flour with uh, with with cauliflower and artichokes on it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I opened up there um, right as other people were getting ready to do that. You know, it kind of now. I mean, a lot of places have opened out there. In the time that I was out there, quite a few. Uh, you know, more Neapolitan style or New York style or whatever. I mean, it's all, the pizza industry is pretty wide open right now and pretty, pretty much like you can get sort of something everywhere in any state. But prior to that, not really. That was around, I would say the eight years that I was out there was sort of the turning point in, you know, the accessibility of pizza throughout America. You're not to skip too, too much. Over. I mean, did you change anything about what you did while you were there? We took credit cards. <laughs> it wasn't cash only anymore. Um, we ran it a little bit. Yeah, no, pizza-wise, the pizza is still the evolution. No, it didn't change. I mean, at that point, I had already been using a mixing machine for like a year or maybe a little more than a year in the East Village because I had started to have to use it because I just physically couldn't meet the demand and I was still making all the dough and I was making every pizza and I was like just physically like being consumed and I had gotten a mixer, used it for a couple of weeks and sold it and went back to hand mixing because I felt like it wasn't what I wanted to do. Then like another year passed and finally in the East Village I got one and I stuck with it to this day. So that wasn't really a change. I would say the only changes were just that, again, that back to that natural kind of progression and evolution of like sourcing ingredients to constant search for what works best and just constantly playing with the, the flour, the blend, the fermentation process, the oven temperatures, tweaks up and down. Um, but other than that, no. Different tomatoes in California? Um, yeah, yeah, the tomatoes are different. In a good way different. or a bad way? Um, Tomato-wise, about the same. I mean, you know, the tomatoes that you can get in California are still seasonal. Um, so, you know, the ones like that you get out there when they're not local are usually from like Mexico. And here on the East Coast, again, it's usually from Mexico or Israel or, you know, hot house grown. So it's sort of the same, the same boat. I mean, the produce in California is amazing, though. Like, I mean, it's pretty, pretty incredible. I mean, the availability of it, the price of it is better, you know, like just even as a consumer, let alone a restaurateur. Want to help save the planet? Here's an idea. Go nude. Unfortunately, not wearing clothes isn't realistic for most of us. But buying sustainable clothing is. Here's Gordon Seabury, CEO of Toad & Co. 
few know, the garment production can generate tremendous pollution. So that's why we're hellbent on offering cleaner, sustainably made clothing that's stylish and long-lasting. But that's only half the battle at Toad & Co. When it comes to hitting our business goals, we've learned to focus on what we're good at and seek partners for other areas of expertise. So when it came to ensuring a consistent customer experience across all sales channels and knowing what was going on with all aspects of our business, we chose NetSuite by Oracle. They know business systems. We know eco-friendly clothes. A perfect match. From accounting and finance to commerce and human resources, NetSuite is the number one business system to help you simply manage your business. Right now, go to netsuite.com slash toad to get your free guide, Crushing the Five Barriers to Growth. That's netsuite.com slash toad for your free guide. And to hear Gordon bear all on Toad & Co.'s Growth Story. So then you come back to New York and what brought you back? What brought me back was throughout all the time that I had been doing this now from, you know, New Jersey, New York, SF, people were really like, man, you got to get some help. You got to evolve. You got to grow. And I was always like, no, 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 no. I'm just going to make everything. And people had always been in my ear about like, you know, are you going to grow? Are you going to change? And I had, uh, you know, over the years had many people come to me and be like, we're going to franchise it. We're going to open in Vegas. We're going to do this. We're going to do sauce. We're going to do, uh, uh, uh. and obviously, you know, I'm like an independent guy and I was always struggling and trying to be like, you know, I would always follow these leads to see where they led and God knows maybe one day it would be the pipe dream. And I'm like, yes, I'm out. <laughs> And um, none of them ever were. And so, you know, while I was out there, the lease was about to run its course. I let it run its course. And I kind of had told the, the owners of the building, like, you know, I'm going to go on a month to month. And they were cool with it. And I'm going to figure out, like, what the plan is. And so I started thinking, like, do I want to renew and stay out here for another eight years? Or is it time to uproot and maybe move to LA or come back East or whatever, or move to Italy um, for that matter. So that started about a year of searching and meeting with people and discussing with different restaurateurs, some of the bigger names all over the country to like see what would make sense. And it was a really awesome experience because it gave me an insight into the fact that basically every single restaurateur that I met has their theory on what works and it's cause it's working for them, but every one of them is completely different on what sells, what doesn't, what the concept should be, how big it should be, how small it should be and all this stuff. So I ran through this whole like thing of like, one person would be like, we're gonna open a place with like two floors and then it's gonna have 500 seats and the pizza's not even gonna matter. And another person's like, we're gonna open a small place and it's gonna be this and you know, <laughs> so I, I went through this and, um, all the while trying to think, do I want to just stay independent or do I want to go in with people? Do I want to raise money? Do I want to, because I, up to that point, it had all been me completely independent with all my own money, except that initial thing of, you know, my mom and dad and grandma with the bakery to that first little pizzeria. After that, it had been just me, my money and working it to always keep this thing floating. So that was also a big decision and a big step. That's how we ended up coming back, long story short. Sorry, I'm going sideways no, no, on that, but that was sort of the thing. So I started trying to decide, do I want to go big? And, you know, and so we were at that point debating seriously between my family and I between LA or New York. And I was really leaning towards LA. I love LA. I want to live there in a house on the hill somewhere. I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> um, but I do love it. Pick um, the right hill. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's a, yeah, but I love New York City also, and it's where I'm from. So obviously coming back here always was easier and felt like home. Um, and that's sort of what we landed on. So we ended up doing a deal with some people and, you know, planning to come back here and, and reopen. And it was, you know, obviously also kind of a big deal for me and the brand because it was my, you know, so-called homecoming or return when I had left New York in that strange way of just up and leaving without even telling anybody. I left at the height of my career for that time. And I didn't give anybody a chance to not like what we were doing. And it was also before like, you know, 
internet stuff and before so many other pizzerias and so much stuff going on and you know all that so I had kind of left at a good spot so coming back was like kind of a big deal for me and for for Una so it seemed like it was a good idea and it would be kind of a, a shoe into having a, a pretty good success um, and that was sort of the plan you know so you came back and came back you but you started working with two other chefs right um Fabian and Vaughn. Jeremiah. The two of them, as strange as it seemed to other people, it seemed to make sense to, to me and to them. Um, you know, I mean, what I think drew us to the idea of doing it together was one, Jeremiah, uh, who was one of the partners that I was going to do it with, really was deeply uh, influenced by Una Pizza and East Village. And it was a big thing to him. So he had that towards me, which was something beautiful for me. So that gave us some standing ground right off the bat of like, well, this guy and I have this thing. And he had these memories and images of going there and being influenced by it and all this stuff. Um, but beyond that initial thing, what kind of made sense, I think, to us at that time was like, you know, really just about like trying to do excellence and that was definitely what they were interested in, and that's what I've always been interested in. So we weren't really looking at it as like, well, that's fine dining, this is pizza. I think we kind of foolishly probably didn't take into account that the public was not gonna be into that, and that was sort of what happened, um, because we just felt like, well, I, I'm you know, pretty good at what I'm doing and really care about it. They're good at what they're doing and care about it. We're just gonna each do what we do, and put it together and try to make it make sense and hopefully people get that this is like an amazing experiment. Um, that wasn't how it actually went, but that was the plan. <laughs> Got it. And so Peter Wells yeah. wrote an incredible review of Una's, called it the best sit down pizzeria in all five boroughs. So what what changed? Did anything change after that? I mean, you're already popular, but... Yeah, I mean, you know what changed? And uh, so uh, my manager and I talk about this stuff all the time. Obviously, all of us within the circle of the place and stuff talk about it. I mean, definitely. I mean, you know, we opened up last year. We got three reviews. Pete's was one of them, and they all stunk, um, you know, and it Even was... he wrote a review when you came back that critiqued everything everything yeah choices, and us together everything yeah it was it was a one-star review um and we also got two the two other sort of important reviews uh, not from him but from other people were also relatively negative if not negative they were kind of like eh, they certainly weren't going to make you like run out and eat here from that point to you know a little before pete's re-review you know, we had kind of uh, went our separate ways, uh, myself and the two guys, on how we were going to run the business. And I took it over around probably October, November um, of last year and just spent the winter, winter kind of like sort of trying to get it back to what I think the place should be. Not to say what we did wasn't awesome, and in a lot of ways it wasn't. It was almost before it's time in a sense, because it was weird to us that people didn't get it. Even if I, in some ways, didn't want to stay the way that we were, or maybe they didn't, certainly I felt, even if I'm happier with the way it is now, I felt like I couldn't believe people didn't get how awesome it was what we were doing. Where are you going and getting like, you know, lobster and a pizza and everything is amazing, everything. Like, if you don't get what we're doing as, a, like, a simulation of it all coming together, okay. But, like, to me, everything that we were putting out from beginning to end was excellent. Every single thing. And that really hurt me and it hurt them, I think, on what we cared about. Obviously, the, 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 the coming together as people and everything else, that's a different story and it has nothing to do with it. Um, but... Either way, because these reviews, we ended up having like the entire winter after that. And people, I think a lot of people were kind of like almost happy that that happened to us, that we weren't being received well back. A lot of pizza guys were probably like, ah, screw Anthony. Who's he? 
Um, these guys that like don't even know how to make pizza still and think they do. Um, but you know, we just basically like, we kind of all decided like, I'm going to take it over. I'm going to run it the way I want. I'm going to make it be what I think it should be. And we just, you know, buckled down and we're like, we're doing this thing. And we got through a terribly dark winter. We went into what is already a tough season for a restaurant on the Lower East Side. And we survived through it. And I just was like, I'm refusing to not do what I believe is right in here. And we did it. And slowly and organically and naturally, we started having people coming back in. And I changed the way it looked a little bit inside. I made it feel and play music the way I wanted and just make it be what I thought Una should be. And little by little, people started coming in and being like, oh my God, this place is amazing. We're like, yeah, it is. It was already, but it is now in this way. Um, and then, yep, he came in and it did change a lot. Um, it, it mainly gave everyone that worked here with me through this miserable winter of suicide, like, hey, you know what? We're doing something cool here. And I was really happy that pretty much every single person that worked in this restaurant with me, you know, as a server, as a pizza guy with me, was here through all this. So they were here in the beginning. They saw myself and the two guys separate. They saw the struggles. They saw the place suffering. They saw the place barely surviving. They saw everything. And then we just kept doing it and doing it and doing it and being like, we're doing the best. We're doing the best. Screw it. We're going to keep doing it. And then to get that re-review, it was kind of like, oh my God, you see, we were onto something. It kind of just was like a really beautiful kind of pat on the back for all of us to be like it was worth the fight and the struggle and the darkness um so that was cool yeah and plus then now when i go around other restaurants the other restaurant people can't be like oh how are you guys doing down there like secretly kind of laughing <laughs> like ha ah, they only got one star yeah. so now they can't do that because we got two stars in a critic's pick yeah well, and then he then he goes off and rips uh, Peter Luger's too much uh, fanfare. Yeah, you know, so the owner of Peter Luger's and I are friends, and he actually ate in here last night of by total coincidence that you bring this up. Um, yeah, I'm not going to really say much about that because it's not any of my business. I personally love Peter Luger's. That's what I will say. And... Yeah, I think it's a, a, you know, and a lot of people have jumped on the bandwagon to say this since it came out and defend it. Um, I think what they do is like, you know, what it should be. I've, I've eaten there tons of times. And if you were to say to me, let's go out, where do you want to go? That is definitely going to be one of the top choices for me to go as a whole experience. Like, I like the service. I like the way that they handle themselves and yeah, I think it's well. Awesome. I mean, in, in the good news for them is they can survive a oh, bad yeah, review yeah, from yeah, yeah. Peter Wells. Yeah, they're not. They're not like yeah. They're not. They're not going to stop doing exactly what they do the way they do it until they say to themselves, "We're done." Right. And until that time, no one can stop them. Yeah. Um, I want to. I want to end with a few kind of rapid fire things. Sure. I'll try to keep it short. Sorry. Now they, well, no, no, no. It's fine. It's just like. Um, these are kind of rapid style things. And you brought up uh, some of the, the New York food scene, the San Francisco food scene. People argue about which one has the better restaurants. Um, I don't know how much time you had and still have to go out to other restaurants, but what, what's your vote, New York or San Francisco? New York, and I don't want to upset anybody in California, New York restaurants work harder. That's a fact. Maybe in L.A., I don't know, but I'm telling you, in San Francisco, like, everybody's done at 9 o'clock at night. Like, people take off on the weekends. They go out hiking. I mean, it's great. I'm not complaining. I wish I was still doing that. But, like, New York City life and New York City restaurants, it is a completely different animal. I mean, this is hardcore living across the board. Like, people work insane amount of hours here in restaurants. They work super late. And honestly, like, their day off... If they have a day off, it's usually one day a week. They usually just go out and eat in another restaurant. <laughs> You're not going out hiking. Where are you hiking? Central Park. You know what I mean? Like in California, it's like, oh, I went Saturday and Sunday and we went up to like Bolinas and we went camping and we have a trailer and this and that, which is amazing. And I'm jealous and I wish I was, like I said, still doing that. But 
I think on the work side of things, New York City is like no other city in America when it comes to work. For good or for bad. I mean, if you want to get something done, this is the town to do it in. This is a serious place. And it's serious because it's insanely expensive. And across the board from rents to the Board of Health comes down on you with fines to everything. I mean, there is no room here. There is no wiggle room here for mistakes or you will be out on the street quick. And I know you don't chase trends, especially in pizza, but um, what other trends in pizza do you particularly like or have been surprised by in a good way in the past few years? Um, what I really love in the past few years is this rediscovery of like Italian-American East Coast pizza and making it really great. You know, like there, you know, when I was a kid growing up in New Jersey, I mean, you're talking about a place where like every single person I knew was either Italian or Irish pretty much. And there's deep roots in that Italian American culture. And the pizza that I grew up having was fantastic. And it's because it was before, you know, people were buying frozen dough, buying pre-shredded cheese, buying pre-made sauce. This was like every pizzeria made the dough there, made the sauce there, cut up the cheese in the place. They cooked it in deck ovens. It wasn't like, you know, artisan or whatever you want to call it. But every pizzeria had their own, like, trademark, their own style, their own taste, their own flavor profiles. And that slowly changed as the pizza industry grew and pizzerias started just buying, like, frozen dough and all the pre-graded, you know, imitation mozzarella cheese. And that sort of became what America and the East Coast knew of as like East Coast pizza, New York pizza. But there's been a big movement back to like kind of making that style of pizza, but actually using like good flour, making the dough yourself, trying to understand more about fermentation within that, using better quality mozzarella cheese and making your own sauce. So it's been like really awesome to almost see like, pizza from like the 60s and 70s almost coming back now to what it what it what it was then there was a big lull in like the late 80s 90s and 2000s where like that style of like sliced pizza became like really like on the verge of unedible most of the time so that's probably the coolest the coolest trend i've seen the neapolitan thing and all that like i'm kind of like over that and i i think on the back side of that, what we've seen is a lot of people that got the wood-fired ovens and quickly realized that they actually don't know how to use them properly or cook pizza in them. So they've kind of gone the other way and been like, oh, I'm going to use a wood oven but cook really slowly. And I think that that can make good pizza, but I think it's also kind of a, a knee-jerk reaction to the actual difficulties of using a wood-burning oven the way it's meant to be used, which is at a very high temperature. Two, three minutes? No, like a minute and a half max. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Um, and what about water? So you're moving to, you're opening a new store in New Jersey, Atlantic Highlands, you've called the water there miracle water. What, what is it about the water? Yeah, so I, you know, somebody, I don't know how this thing is spreading around like this. Um, I haven't made dough with the water yet, so oh, okay. I don't know. What I was told, so how this all started was, I started finding out from people in the town that um, I guess this woman many, many years ago had wanted to create like a water system there that was like incredible and second to none. And it got put into place and it's continued to be like that. So the water is supposedly like this incredible fountain of youth water. And to the degree that there's a brewery in town that started out very small and has grown to be really large and they stayed in town supposedly purposely because they want to still be able to use the water. That's the story on the water. Um, I'm excited to see what happens to the dough. I hope it just helps move it along on its path. Thoughts on um, Chicago style pizza? Again, like I, you know, I, I uh, excuse me, I like all pizza. I think Chicago style pizza can be awesome. I mean, I don't really know that much about it. I've only been there once and I tried a bunch of it. Um, I have nothing against it. I mean, again, like I think if you, you know, if you melt cheese and put stuff on top of it, it's tasty, you know, and then it goes from there. It's like, it really just depends how much of a deep dive 
you want to take as the guy cooking it or making it or as the customer, you know, like with coffee or whatever. It's really... Last thing. So um, we're, we're doing a podcast so people can't see, but the, the oven is right out in the open. Yeah. And you still cook. Yes. I mean, not every single pizza, obviously, um, which uh, basically... So this place we started, and I ended up making every single pizza until probably... Um, more or less like the winter of last year. And then I started having people helping me. And then it's been like back and forth where it's like, you know, me by myself, me with somebody, me not here at all. Um, we're definitely in a transition here. I have, you know, cultivated a beautiful uh, team of people that, you know, have the same passion and the same focus. And we're all trying to stay on the mission, which is make this kind of pizza with the 20 plus year history that we have and just keep like shooting for the bar and go above it and make it better. And as long as you can cultivate people around you like that and have like, you know, like as if a friend of mine says like A plus people around you and people that are better than you around you, then it just keeps you growing and I learn new things and we hopefully all inspire each other and you can come in and get what the point of the place is well, we from LA hope you do come to LA at some point and make pizzas. But if you retire in LA, that's cool too. Well, if I retire in LA, I'll put an oven in the backyard and we'll have pizza parties once a I week. Like <laughs> I like it. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. All I can say is wow and yum. Tony's story and his passion in the pursuit of making the best pizza is inspiring. I mean, this is this is his life. And I love that he's now taken that passion and invested it into his co-chefs and the people that work with him. And that's something all business owners can learn from. I mean, his passion is just, it's contagious. Like yeah. it made me want to go like, let's start making pizzas. Let's yeah. do it. Let's get in the kitchen. <laughs> the best dough. Let's yeah. just make the best dough. Yeah, I loved it. And it also rubbed off on me in terms of like, he pursued his passion and his his whole thing is, you know, you keep, pursuing it until you've gotten it right and he i've asked him have you made the perfect pizza and he said i think i've made it a couple times but it's <laughs> it's always going to continue to get better yeah yeah so what a story thank yeah. you so much to tony mangieri for joining us on this episode of the grow wire podcast uh, i also want to thank our sponsors at the second city ring our editors over at lampstand as well as our producer kendall fisher for writing some words that I said. Okay, I also moved the little knobs on the sound mixer, okay? Okay. It's like I basically could DJ at a club. That's like what I'm doing. <laughs> All right, there we go. This is uh, this is our little club here. Bow, 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 bow. <laughs> and of course, thank all of you for listening and for tuning in. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Bye. You just listened to the Grow Wire podcast with host Fritz Nelson. Make sure to keep tuning in for more episodes full of tips, tools, stories, and strategies to help take your personal and professional growth to the next level. Until next time.